Y2K fashion trends that are about to make a comeback. If you've seen this channel before, then you know I have a fondness for the 2000s. Not only does it remind me of my younger days, when my biggest problem was downloading the wrong thing off LimeWire and having it fry the family computer, but I think the 2000s aesthetic itself is super fun. Even if there are some parts that are terrible in hindsight, it's become common practice for people to deride the 2000s as one of the worst times for fashion, as if every decade doesn't have its heinous fashion moments. But here's the thing, Y2K style is set to make a comeback. No, not everything is going to be popular again. I don't ever see dresses over jeans recovering from the many years of online ridicule, but there are other trends that you probably thought you'd never see again that are going to be making a comeback. Much like how mid-2010s fashion took inspiration from the grunge style of the 90s, you're going to be seeing a lot of people take the more salvageable parts of the 2000s aesthetic and give it a 2020 makeover. What's important for everyone to understand is that fashion is cyclical, and while there are occasionally new innovations in the industry, for the most part we're just taking trends of the past and rehashing them for present day consumers. This is commonly referred to as the quote unquote 20 year rule, where a fashion trend will go from popular to despised to popular again over the course of 20 or so years. An easy example of this fashion phenomenon is the mom jean, where the high-rise style was adored by women in the 90s but hated in the 2000s, typically by the younger generation, before regaining popularity in the 2010s. Things like that have been going on for ages and are largely fueled by nostalgia. The 70s were all about the 50s, the 90s were all about the 70s, and the 2010s were all about the 90s. See the pattern? This made the 2000s aesthetic return inevitable, predictable even. After all, it has been 20 years, as much as that pains me to say. In other words, anything that is old can become new again. Like any decade, American fashion in the 2000s can be divided into distinct periods. The Y2K era, or early 2000s, which was a period that was heavily influenced by the 90s and the new millennium. The mid-2000s took inspiration from fashion trends of the 50s and 60s, and in the late 2000s, there was an 80s revival. Something that I've noticed when people talk about the fashions of the 2000s is that they lack the ability to differentiate between these previously mentioned periods. The early 2000s actually aren't as awful as we make them out to be, and it doesn't come as a surprise that the fashions from that specific time period are the ones that are set to regain popularity. It's also important to note that the 2000s unique aesthetic isn't by chance. It was a time period when young designers were rebelling against traditional ideals of fashion and subverted expectations by bringing youth culture into the picture. Think Alexander McQueen at Givenchy, John Galliano at Dior, or Tom Ford at Gucci. While this alienated many of the brand's original and older clientele, it also brought in new money and interest in fashion houses that had been on the decline. A modern day comparison is what Virgil Abloh did for Louis Vuitton. In the rest of this video, I'll be discussing fashion trends from the 2000s that I suspect will be making a comeback in the next few years. At least, in the theoretical version of the 2020s where we can go outside safely again. So, let's get into it. The exposed thong. I know what you're thinking. No way is the whale tail coming back. And yes, you'd be right. At least, partly. The original trend, which was really only popular in the early 2000s, was due to the combined popularity of low-rise jeans, higher-cut thongs, and the layering trend. Its name, the whale tail, came from the Y shape created when the underwear showed above the waistband. The whale tail essentially became an accessory, and at one point clip-on underwear jewelry was available and pants with built-in thongs could even be purchased. Celebrities of all sorts hopped onto the trend, from Halle Berry to Gillian Anderson to Paris Hilton. It was often derided by the general public as being trashy and cheap, which of course prompted teenagers to hop on the trend as a way of rebelling. 
While current celebs like Alexa Demi, Kim Kardashian, and Hailey Bieber have sported full-on whale tails to events, most iterations of the trend are subtler, only slightly exposing the sides of the thong, which you can see here on Normani, Bella Hadid, and Jennifer Lopez. Do you think you'll be wearing this trend? Rhinestones. Less is more was an unheard of phrase in the 2000s, and nothing is more evidence of that than the rhinestone trend. Not only did most of our clothes come bedazzled, you could even buy products to do it at home. Rhinestones are on our phones, on belts, and of course, on denim. Expect to see some subtle rhinestone details on a lot more accessories, specifically sunglasses, and back on jeans and tees in the 2020s. Sequins, another shiny trend. You could spot sequins on dresses, shoes, and purses. While I think the trend hasn't quite come back yet, I guarantee it will. Asymmetry. I've talked about my dislike for the high-low or mullet dress before. Yes, I wore it at the time it was popular, as I'm sure many of us in the 2010s did, but in hindsight, I've recognized it wasn't the most flattering. At least, not on a person like me who is mostly leg. But asymmetry in the 2000s was an entirely different animal. Shirts and dresses of the time would often have asymmetric hems, going from side to side instead of front to back. Straps would be uneven, either being different widths or missing one entirely. I think a one shoulder top or dress can not only be a lot of fun, but versatile as well. I think the key to making this trend work is keeping it subtle and seeing where the dress or top hits your body. Just because something looks good on one person doesn't necessarily mean it'll look the same on another. Logo Mania while fashion brands have been using easily identifiable logos and monograms on their products for decades, the logo mania trend as we currently know it must be accredited to black culture and streetwear. In the 1980s, American fashion designer Dapper Dan began creating quote-unquote knockups, which were articles of clothing that featured bootlegged prints of luxury brands like Fendi, Louis Vuitton, and Gucci. His custom designs not only helped create a modern image for these older brands, but made them more attainable for non-white clientele. His ideas ultimately paved the way for other designers to feature their brand's logos more ostentatiously, and soon enough, logo obsession was everywhere. Throughout the late 90s and early 2000s, brands like Louis Vuitton, Tommy Hilfiger, Moschino, and Christian Dior boldly showed off their logos, which was not only a brilliant marketing move, but eventually became a status symbol, which, ironically enough, was also Logomania's downfall. By the early 2010s, following the Great Recession that had begun in 2007, excess spending and flaunting one's money was no longer seen as enviable but distasteful which resulted in less emphasis on brand names and more on affordable fast fashion something we've begun to see lose popularity in recent years with a push towards supporting small businesses and sustainability today logo mania has not only been embraced on the runway by high fashion brands but heavily monogrammed articles of clothing and accessories can be seen on celebrities and influencers alike with some free Frequent wearers including Rihanna, Billie Eilish, Nava Rose, and Bella Hadid. Speaking of which, here are six Y2K brands that I think are going to make a major comeback in the 2020s. Many of these brands released clothing that encapsulated a multitude of other trends I'll be discussing in this video, so I won't be going into too much depth about that. I'll just be focusing on the brand in general. Von Dutch. Known for the bowling bags and trucker hats that had their name, the Von Dutch apparel brand was launched in 1999 and skyrocketed to fame after being worn by the likes of Britney Spears, Justin Timberlake, and Nicole Richie. The general aesthetic of the brand took inspiration from custom culture, the term used to encapsulate the fashions and art of those involved in car and motorcycle customization. Von Dutch was wildly popular in its heyday, but after designer Christian Odigier left to work for Ed Hardy in 2004, the brand's popularity dipped. While I don't see trucker hats making a huge return in general, Von Dutch's bags and other apparel would make for interesting statement pieces. Juicy Couture Founded in 1997, Juicy Couture is perhaps the brand that is most synonymous with the early 2000s. Their iconic Juicy Couture velour tracksuit, which was first created for Madonna in 2001, was worn by celebs like Jennifer Lopez, Paris Hilton, and Vanessa Hudgens, and became a must-have for women everywhere. They were also an early sign of the coming athleisure trend. 
Besides the tracksuits, the brand also made handbags, sunglasses, jewelry, and perfume. I see velour tracksuits coming back in a major way in the 2020s. Playboy. Playboy, which originally began as a male entertainment magazine, was founded in 1953 by the now deceased Hugh Hefner. In the years since the nudie mag's creation, Playboy has become a full-fledged enterprise, with apparel, a chain of restaurants, and even TV shows. While you may not be familiar with the original print magazine, you're likely to recognize their logo, a black bunny with a bow tie, a reference to the idiom, they f*** like rabbits. Their Playboy Club, which has a rather sketchy business model, even named their waitresses bunnies, with the girls wearing lingerie and rabbit ears. I recall owning Playboy branded pajamas as a tween in the 2000s and never understood why it got such horrified responses. I was a fairly sheltered child. While I don't agree with the Playboy brand as a whole, sure, it's cute and definitely iconic. Just look at all these different on-screen bunnies. Baby fat. Created by Kimora Lee Simmons in 1999 as a parallel brand to her then-husband's fat farm, the urban women's wear apparel brand took inspiration from Simmons' background, with the cat logo being inspired by her cat, Max. In an interview, Simmons stated that her main ideology behind the brand was to create a place for women of color to have freedom and a voice in the streetwear industry that they'd been pushed out of. The brand quickly became the favorite for women in the music industry. Baby Fat became so popular that at one point a limited edition Motorola flip phone was released, which was baby pink with diamonds and cost $699. Like many of the brands that were popular in the 2000s, the Baby Fat hype died down by the end of the decade, but the brand's recent relaunch has me excited for the future. Ed Hardy Named after and inspired by the American tattoo artist Don Ed Hardy, the Ed Hardy clothing brand was released in 2000. In 2009 alone, the brand made over $700 million, but by 2011 had begun dwindling in popularity. I owned so much Ed Hardy. Shoes, shirts, vests, you name it. I'm actually surprised it's taken this long for the brand to make a comeback, considering a lot of its imagery would have fit in well with the e-girl aesthetic of the late 2010s, minus some rhinestones here and there. This trend is going to be one of those things that's so tacky, it's somehow amazing. Teeny tiny purses. One of the earliest signs that the 2000s were set to have a comeback. Purse sizes have grown and shrunk continually throughout the years, with the bags reaching a laughably large size in the late 2000s and shrinking to the size of a coin purse by the end of the 2010s. Small shoulder bags, a classic Y2K silhouette popularized by the Fendi baguette and the Dior saddlebag, are pretty much all you see nowadays, even if they're just as inconvenient as they were the first time around. In the 2010s, we toned it down a bit in regard to patterns as a result of the rising minimalism trend, with florals and stripes staying around for most of the decade, although chevron, galaxy, emoji, and tribal prints came and went during the decade as well. With the rise of Y2K, we're going to be seeing a major increase in funky prints and patterns in the next few years, so let's go through some of them. Camouflage. Conceived for military use, camo print first made its way into fashion in the 70s as a part of the counterculture statement against the Vietnam War. It became popular again in the 80s when Andy Warhol created a series of colorful camouflage paintings which showed the possibilities of the print outside of greens and browns. Within the black community in the 90s, camouflage print was also popular as army surplus stores had affordable camo pants and vests, which quickly became key streetwear pieces. Due to people of color's influence on the Y2K aesthetic, it's no surprise that camouflage continued to be popular throughout the era, with clothing featuring the print taking over the runways and department stores. Animal print. I've discussed the history of animal print in my Sex and the City video, so I'm not gonna repeat myself too much. What you need to know is that animal print has gone in and out of fashion repeatedly as far back as the 1930s. In the late 2010s, we saw the beginning of the return of animal print, with leopard, zebra, cow, and snake prints becoming wildly popular. The trend popped up in various shades of brown, black, and white, attention-grabbing but still wearable. That's where the 2020s are going to be wildly different, pun intended. We'll be heading out of the more neutral tones and towards bold and playful colors including pinks, blues, greens, and purples. 
basically it'll be like reliving an Elisa Frank poster. If I can offer any advice for those of you interested in the coming trend, I'd say go for pieces where the base is more of a pastel as opposed to a neon. We're not trying to go all the way back to the 80s. For major inspiration, check out the Cheetah Girls movie or the Josie and the Pussycats film. Tie-dye. When you think of tie-dye, your first thought may go to hippies and the psychedelic 60s or maybe the random arts and crafts project you were forced to do as a child. But the colorful print has a lot more going for it than that. First popping up in 2018, the one-of-a-kind print has been featured on the runways of designers like Tom Ford, Versace, and Paco Rabanne. I personally love the trend. Not only does it immediately remind you of childhood and the summertime, but it can make for a fun and affordable DIY project as well. Just make sure everything sets thoroughly. You don't want to wind up like me with an entire load of pink tinged laundry because of a single tie-dye shirt. Paisley. Iterations of the floral teardrop shape pattern can be traced back hundreds of years, with many attributing its origin to ancient Persia. The pattern, which found its way into South and Central Asian cultures, was brought to England and Scotland in the 17th century via the East India Trading Company, and due to its immense popularity, it began to be duplicated in these aforementioned countries. This happens to be where it gets its Western name, Paisley, from after the Scottish town that was producing the design in the 1800s. From there, the pattern spread, with few knowing of its origins. I've met quite a few people who think it's an American or British invention, because you know, cowboys and the Beatles. This just so happens to be one of my all-time favorite patterns, and I will continue to wear it regardless of it being trendy. Tartan. Tartan, or plaid, is one of those patterns that will never go away. Besides being wildly versatile, the tartan pattern is also a large part of Scottish dress. It's also heavily rooted in the punk subculture, which means that as long as punk and rebellion exists, so will plaid. You can see the punk influence on tartan print and on 2000s fashion in general in the designs of Vivian Westwood, Anna Sui, and Betsy Johnson. And I'd be remiss to talk about tartan in the 2000s without bringing up the Burberry Revolution. Before said revolution, the British fashion house was commonly associated with the upper class. In the 2000s, the brand image was hijacked by a younger demographic, and the distinctive Burberry check became a status symbol. You can spot the print in Confessions of a Teenage Drama Queen, in Mean Girls, and in White Chicks. Argyle. The diamond pattern is once again tied to traditional Scottish dress, and in the 1910s, Argyle knitwear spread across other parts of the UK and even across the pond to the US. The look itself is one you might associate with a curmudgeonly grandfather, but it can definitely look chic and cool when paired with other hard textures like leather or denim. Patchwork. This is technically a bunch of different patterns mashed together, but you know what? I'm gonna count it anyway. The look is not only the result of the recent sustainability movement, with many high-end brands actually using leftover fabric scraps, but it also replicates a maximalist yet distinctly vintage vibe that we saw in the 2000s with the rise of the boho chic trend. I'm actually a really big fan of this, at least when it's more subdued. However, I think this will be rather short-lived, so wear it while you can. Vests. Considered a fashion staple, almost everyone owned a vest in the 2000s. The trend was thought of as an easy way to dress up any outfit, resulting in a lot of t-shirt vest combos. Vests could also be buttoned and fitted or unbuttoned and loose, making them versatile. I myself was in love with the vest trend, wearing it into the early 2010s. In the 2020s, the look is going to become more polished and has been featured on the runways of Celine, Dior, and Burberry. With the popularity of matching sets and suits for women in the 2010s, the return of the vest was inevitable. Halter, a crucial part of the 2000s does 70s movement. For every day wear, the silhouette went in and out of fashion repeatedly, typically becoming trendy during periods of time when female empowerment movements were on the rise, which was hardly a coincidence as the silhouette was seen as liberating as it required the wearer to go braless. Get your bag and put on your vizier. Can't wear a bra with it, Dad. It doesn't work. Well, you're hanging out of it. It's supposed to look like this. Everybody wears these. It's modern. Halter tops and dresses were seen on multiple sex symbols throughout the years. They were often worn by Cher and Marilyn Monroe, and in the 2000s on Beyonce, Britney Spears, and Rihanna. The style is wildly versatile, going from casual to dressy easily. I think everyone should own a halter top. 
denim. We were all about denim in the 2000s. Whether that was making crazy jeans, teeny tiny mini skirts, or full blown dresses and suits. In the years to come, I think we'll be seeing a lot more experimentation when it comes to denim. Instead of keeping it strictly simple and skinny, I expect to see a lot of wider silhouettes on jeans, straight legged, flared, and even boot cut. Low rise. I hate to say it, but they're already back. As evidenced by the many TikTokers who love and sport the trend. I already know my older audience is going to laugh at that, but the truth of the matter is that teens are one of the most influential demographics when it comes to fashion. And in this social media driven age, those are the people who can dictate what is going to become popular with a single post. For those of us who lived through the low rise movement the first time, it's unlikely that we'll ever hop back on board, especially as we've aged and developed our own style. But a piece of advice. I recommend buying high-rise styles while you still can, because who knows when they'll disappear from shelves. Mesh. As layering became popular, so did mesh. It came in a variety of different colors and the knit design could vary in thickness. Besides being used as an underlayer, it could also be worn on top of clothing, allowing the wearer to show off skin but still cover what needed to be covered. In the 2020s, it's going to be used the same way. I myself like wearing long-sleeved mesh tops under t-shirts, but there's also nothing wrong with a mesh dress either. Just be careful when washing these, they can tear. If you happen to be looking for inspiration on Instagram, here are some accounts that take the Y2K aesthetic and give them a 2020 spin. Enjoy. So that's it for this video. Don't forget to like and subscribe and comment down below which of these Y2K trends you're most excited about seeing return. I'll see you soon. Bye.